Do you find yourself struggling with your weight? And no matter how many diets you tried, do you find that you're angry all the time and you don't know why? Or better yet, do you sometimes wake up just depressed that day? Nothing really happened. And the more people ask you, what's wrong? What's going on? Do you want to talk about it? You have nothing to tell them because you yourself don't even know what's going on with you. These are just small little examples that we talk about where we're talking about even weight gain, insomnia, um, depression, us sometimes having attitude problems, not wanting to be touched. And the book, The Body Keeps the Score, goes into so many little things that we do every day that are signs of trauma that we need to heal from that we might not even know. You might not even know that you've been traumatized or that you have PTSD. Or even if you suffer with anxiety, ADHD, so many other attention deficit disorders. It stems from a lot of things that happened from our childhood that we don't even know. We're going to dive into all that and more in this book, The Body Keeps the Score. But first, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Korean Allure Mental Gems. This channel is dedicated to leveling up in all areas of your life. Let us learn together, read together, but most importantly, grow together. Without further ado, let's get into this video. So this is a book club video and we are doing The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Aside from the Bible I would say has now become my number one favorite book and you guys know I do book club here I have a whole playlist with all the books we've done from the 48 laws of power the game of life and how to play it and how to win friends influence people like all the most popular books I have read and we have so much more becoming bulletproof was another favorite but we have so much more that we've done and so much more to do but so far I can say it is a very transformative book if there's any book that's going to transform your life it's this one I cannot stress that enough and it is a book it took me so long to do a book club um, for this channel because this book it's not that it took me so long to read <laughs> but I found myself going back to chapters I know it's just transformative you will cry I was crying like a baby kept going back and I do say aside from the Bible I really 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 do love this book a lot it has about nine takeaways but I'm going to focus only on the ones a couple to kind of get you interested to get the book because I really don't want to like give you everything he definitely knows what he's talking about he's very passionate with the work of psychiatry and um, psychology and helping people and helping people um children it all starts as children it all starts with us being children right let's jump right in with the first takeaway okay intro of the book is talking about ptsd he breaks down what ptsd is who has it different things that give you ptsd or trauma and it's not always being physically touched a lot of people attribute trauma and you know like ptsd or being like of being victimized like you were either touched and there's just so many other things that traumatize us daily from being in a car accident he uses a lot of different examples or even just having a bad parent they might not have like physically touched you but you didn't feel love like when your parents looked at you when you were a child you never recall anyone um, looking at you excited to see you or happy to see you in the home or even if you came from a home where your parents weren't lovey-dovey with each other it was kind of like even if they didn't put hands on each other but they you know there was no love there there was no holding hands there was no kisses it was just a dry cold environment being in a coma being on certain medications there's just so many forms of trauma but people typically talk about the most which is being touched without your consent having violence being bullied and you know substance use being around certain things but even growing up in poverty is a form of trauma and all of these things can give you PTSD what is triggering within the first chapter because the very first chapter can be triggering is when he gives all of the examples and when he talks about the people that found out about things that happened to him like you could be 30 you could be 40 or 50 that's when memories come to you for whatever reason your brain disassociated that when you were a child and you just don't remember and you just get older and these memories start coming to you like am I tripping did this this didn't happen like you think you're tripping and he gives an, an example of a young man who was touched by a priest and he didn't remember his own encounter with that same priest touching him without his consent when he was a little kid until somebody else was telling their story and he starts to vividly remember everything the same person is saying that same room the touching him the same way etc that he just loses it and starts to have a panic attack right then and there and he just all his life always remembered that priest in a positive light and this is why they say sometimes victims talk 
years later and people are like why you waited so long girl da, 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 or boy da, da, da. this is crazy and he talks about also when this happens to men the masculine men a lot of them go to the gym um, to get fit buff you know especially if you witness your mom get attacked or brutalized or if it happened to you you feel like getting bigger is a way and a way to protect yourself you know even a lot of women where they have out of control eating obesity and stuff like that it comes from a lot of these things and it's just like once you know and then there's practical ways to start helping because I what I love about this book it's not just telling you or describing to you what the phenomenons are or just the words and stuff like that and giving examples but he also tells you the specific type of therapy you need to do for this specific type of trauma or issue and even practical ways that you can overcome even talking the number one thing that i found really important message that he gave was to speak to never hold a secret for anybody holding a secret for anyone will be what <laughs> stops your healing your journey you got to think if someone victimized you, they didn't care about your feelings. OK, a lot of people pleasers are people pleasers because they were touched, you know, and they feel like there's something I could have done to not be touched or to not go through this. Or maybe my parents could have loved me more. They would have stayed together and not be divorced and this and that. So you go around with that burden because kids are very self-centered, self-absorbed when they're little because that's just how they have to be. All of us were, you know, we we make everything about us. That's just how the undeveloped mind is. So even if it's not the child's fault, if a parent get divorced, they're, they're going to look at it like it's their fault and see there's something I, I did wrong. I could have made this parent be home more. And a lot of us have experienced that where there's something I could do, you know, um, I'm responsible for this and in a sense you become a slave to that and it's just interesting to see the dynamics of how people even become people pleasers and how they try to rectify that with themselves and when you don't have control over certain things of your life how you compensate for that whether it's eating whether it is mutilating yourself by you know cutting or self-harm or whether it's sabotaging certain aspects of your life relationship there's so many stories in this book about people who sabotage their relationships um, because it was too peaceful and they just wanted that trauma like what they're familiar with I don't know it was just a phenomenal book so the PTSD part was the first takeaway which he gets into a better knowledge and understanding of PTSD and he talks about resources for veterans etc just really great right the second takeaway is trauma creates a different kind of memory than ordinary events unlike remembering an ordinary event when someone experiences the memory of a traumatic event they are virtually reliving the experience and his analysis on this and I'm using insta read for that I suggest you guys get membership and use them it's really good um, it says that ordinary memories have beginnings middles and ends they are seamlessly integrated into a person's story of their life and the person usually moves on a traumatic memory is a sensory and visual experience it fires up the visual cortex of the brain and creates physiological changes the traumatized person experiences the memory as if the trauma is happening at the current moment it is not integrated and the person does not move on although there are different theories that explains the relationship with memory and trauma a lot of research has shown that traumatic memories are processed and remembered in a fundamentally different way from other memories. Traumatic memories differed from memories of other important life events, both in vantage point and the number of details. It is this extremely detailed, almost cinematic memory that occurs from a trauma that makes it hard to forget. After a trigger, the person is pushed back into the trauma, experiencing the memory again as if they are seeing it in the present. The vividness of the traumatic memories hijacks the brain and prevents the person from living in the present, making them numb and disassociated from normal life. This takeaway helped me to really understand what someone is seeing when they're having a panic attack or PTSD, how they're struggling with it. And even if you've had anxiety attacks before or panic attacks. So what it happens with PTSD is when they get triggered, it's as if they're in the moment, like it's happening right then and there, right? So that's how you see veterans, they start to scream, oh, no, 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 they're running as if like a bomb is actually dropping on them or something. It's as if everything that they experience that traumatize them is happening to them or a victim. Sometimes he gives example how some people in the middle of intimacy with their husbands and wives or wives that they'll be triggered from being touched at a younger age and just out of nowhere, they're either like they start to reenact what was happening, get mad, fight the person off when 
it's just like they go into a rage and some people they don't go into a rage because some people if they just checked out when this was happening to them maybe they didn't fight back or they didn't um use vocalize because they just felt powerless especially if they were younger they might just check out during intimacy just check out and lay there and start to think if that ever happens to you and you know it's not that you hate your spouse or they're boring or anything like that and it happens to you where you just check out your you know staring into space thinking about what you're going to cook like you're disassociating you're removing yourself from what's happening in the present then that could be a sign that you know there was some trauma there and a lot of times when that happened you might misread that if you are in, like it's a suppressed memory or something you might misread that as you're just bored with your partner and you need to go try out somebody new and they just can't you know and then now you're looking for more and more people this is why a lot of traumatized and victimized people are the people that always usually feel like they need to try out multiple people to be intimate with which in turn creates more trauma and you're never really healing so when someone say you're literally sick so you're literally just trying to um, find this connection when sometimes you heal of course it's not the case for for every situation but it is something to consider the third takeaway is after a traumatic incident the fight or flight impulse is thwarted creating a cycle of anxiety increased stress and disassociation from everyday life when humans are stressed they feel a rush of cortisol and adrenaline the hormones involved in the fight or flight mechanism in situations where people are able to work with others escape a difficult situation or take control their fight or flight response subsides and they are able to live normally in situations of trauma the traumatized individual is unable to escape or assert control and they stay in a cycle of high stress and anxiety or go into a frozen state even when the threat has subsided the individual feels better in moments of stress and seeks out more situations of high stress or seeks to blunt the pain with alcohol or substances the continual return to high stress environments have been well documented in a 2010 article in the huffington post the hurt locker and what it means to be addicted to war michael hastings an author and war correspondent discussed his experience with war as a substance despite the fact or perhaps because the woman he planned to marry was taken out of here in a kidnapping in Iraq, Hastings kept returning to war, addicted to covering it. Hastings discusses the Catherine Bigelow film, The Hurt Locker, where the main character is unable to return to civilian life and must return to do another tour. Healing means breaking the cycle of stress mobilization and bringing the person into the present where the danger is gone. Like if you've ever seen a child that is like an adrenaline junkie and they look for danger they want to do that oftentimes not in all cases of course but in trauma most people are not always looking for high stressful situations or to be working there's people that literally look for stress like, they cannot just chill and be peaceful like everybody else they look for the stress they thrive in stress and oftentimes when that happens it's just they feel more comfortable in stress the best way i can give an example is if you've been in a when you look at a person who's been in a situation right where their spouse put hands on them a lot of times a lot of you guys are like why you keep going back or how you leave this one toxic situation and then you go to another one this explains it perfectly and a lot of us who don't understand mental health we judge the person and we criticize them like you can get yourself out of this you can do this you just choose to yes in a, in a way it is true i'm not trying to say to um be a perpetual victim but a lot of times this explains why and if we just had more compassion and understand that okay this person because they couldn't defend themselves in that moment they just stayed and it's like you express it after like it's kind of like you couldn't defend yourself in that moment so you try to keep putting yourself in the same situations to see if you will but you end up with the same results and then the, the best way to defend yourself is just to make sure you never like i just want to look real close to the camera and tell you sometimes the best way to protect yourself and defend yourself from something is not to get somebody back it's literally to make sure you're never in that situation again or never around these people again these type of people that is the best way to get your lick back it's not even to be in their presence or go try to fix that right or things i shouldn't i didn't get to say let me go say it now sometimes the best way to get somebody back is just to remove yourself that's it and not 
even think about getting that revenge. I love that. Takeaway 4 says that trauma affects the brain by hijacking the basic housekeeping system in the emotional brain and decreasing the activity of the rational brain. Brain has three parts. The brain stem, a basic housekeeping system, the limbic brain that deals with emotion, and the prefrontal cortex where reason and analysis of the outside world lives. Trauma short circuits the normal brain processes by taking the rational brain, the prefrontal cortex, offline. Joe, a burn victim, had been welding a tank when there was an explosion. He escaped by climbing out of a small hole. He suffered burns on the sides of his hands, and although the burns were not huge, he experienced immense trauma from the experience. He reported panic attacks, nightmares, and flashbacks, and was unable to go back to his job. He desperately wanted to make himself go back, but he could not. His rational brain was unable to override the emotional brain. Joe said, my boss wants me to go back into the tank to weld, but I'm still trying to get out. So sometimes someone who's been traumatized does not think rationally like someone else so someone else may sit there and just be like it's common sense to xyz well common sense doesn't work he even went deeper into the book which i really want you guys to focus on now in the childhood part where he talks about how children who are victimized really early or suffered through trauma really early and trauma for children could even be being in the NICU having several operations the body keeps the score of that like the memory of that too you grow up it keeps the memory of that or children who even wasn't wanted by their parents but you still gave birth to them when you're giving someone a victim or someone who has PTSD advice you just come off really harsh when you're like beating it down to someone with mental health issues and stuff like that you're beating it down like this should be common sense this should be da 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 well common sense is not so common to victims because their brain is not even wired the same anymore just based off of the trauma that they endured takeaway number five is that trauma has extreme physiological effects effects on the body also. It's not just mental, but it's physical. Trauma activates the vagus nerve, a huge nerve that relays sensory information about the body's organs to the central nervous system. The activation of the vagus nerve causes the physical manifestation of trauma, the feeling of being punched in the gut or having a broken heart. Trauma victims have trouble with sensory perception and other physical conditions such as autoimmune disease. Cumulative childhood stress can affect autoimmune diseases in adults. A 2009 study tracked people in San Diego who had stressful experiences in childhood including physical and mental, you know, domestic violence and substance, you know. The study found that childhood traumatic stress increased the likelihood of hospitalization with an autoimmune disease as an adult. Studies like this open a wide field of research in the physical manifestation of trauma from migraine headaches to seized muscles stress stress is present in the body it is even passed down from mother to child mothers who have stress or physical discomfort during pregnancy can pass it on to their child trauma does not just affect the brain but the body as well this is why I said this has been scientifically proven so if you know anyone pregnant share this video with them and tell them the importance of resting and relaxing and not being in traumatic situations because you're passing that on to your little child right all the division that there's in the world like with the manosphere and feminine feminism and stuff when you look at the bigger picture I feel like once you're educated because a lot of people truly aren't educated on the physiology and the psychology of just human nature is that once you're educated you understand that it is better for men and women to just stick together because if you women are so fragile they should be protected right you can't put all the pressure on a mom alone to make these human beings like you watching you came from a woman right any man mental sphere they all came from women right so in a sense if you have those same men that think they have no responsibility in this but if you're traumatizing the very woman that is about to give birth to the future men of the menosphere. You can't just blame the woman. A lot of people blame single mothers for a lot of things, but you say, where's the father that traumatized these women, that abandoned them in their worst times, now that instilled that same fear that she felt during pregnancy unto that child? You know, that same fear, that same like, what am I going to do? And then now she's on her feet. She's working hard. She's crying every night. You traumatized her. And so you play a major role in that same quote unquote bad child that grows up. Oh, I blame the mothers. I blame the parents not raising them right. Where we all play a role. I've never seen a mom who's just hangry or hungry or just tired or sleep deprived or whatever. And they kind of take that energy onto the children. And he even talks about the importance of children seeing their parents be excited to see them and the importance of children seeing their parents 
have love in their eyes to see them, you know, or even aunties and uncles. There's a lot of kids, the secret formula to it, when you're really excited to see a kid and it's genuine and it's not fake, because kids are so sensitive. They can feel when people are sensitive. It's just like pets and animals and all that stuff. They can feel it, you know. When a kid grows up without ever seeing anyone be excited to see them, every time the kid is talking, you're telling them, leave the room, this is adults talking. You prioritize your kids, you drop them off to grandma all the time. You make them feel like they're not wanted and you just go into the club with your friends, you're partying and you treat them as if they're second-class citizens. I'm not saying parents should not, because he talks about, and many psychologists, experts, talks about the importance of parents getting a break too, vacationing without your kids. You don't have to bring your kid along everywhere because it's not really a vacation, you know? There is an importance of that, but it's also a balance. Kids don't care about the money. They really don't. If you as an adult think about it, what was your most precious memories as a child? It probably involves the simplest thing my parents used to make. I really want you guys to comment below in the comment section if you don't mind sharing, what is your most fond childhood memories? It, I promise you it's something simple. My mom used to make pancakes all the time. I'm talking about with your parents. Your most fond childhood memory with your parents. If your parents was bad, find the one moment that you can remember where they was good. <laughs> if they was just toxic to you all the time. And I bet you it was either some quality time or something very simple. But if you are a parent, it is in your best interest to heal so that your children don't have to heal from you when they get older, okay? You don't want to raise up kids that will have to go to therapy because of the trauma that you inflicted on them. And I know that's hard to hear, but that's why it's so important to really prioritize your mental health, especially if you're a parent, you're an aunt, I, or you are uncle, whatever you are, like you're around children, you're a teacher, even teachers can can you know, project onto other people's kids. You don't know how many times I read headlines, teachers are hitting kids, etc. That's crazy to me, but yeah. Anyways, takeaway six, the attachment style child experience in early life can predict and create trauma, which is what we were just talking about. According to a presentation by Jody Todd, Manley PhD, clinical director of Mount Hope Family Center, University of Rochester, the relationship between a child and a primary caregiver is what allows a child to feel safe and supported. It ensures survival and provides a framework for the child to navigate the world on their own as they grow. Exposure to violence or trauma at home destroys the system of secure attachment and the idea of caregiver as a base of security. Children who have experienced trauma often exhibit the results of disorganized attachment. Likewise, a securely attached child might have a better toolbox to navigate a traumatic situation. Manley's presentation includes a quote by Ellie Weasel, Holocaust survivor, political activist, and author. Just as despair can come to one only from other human beings, hope too can be given to one only from other human beings. I love this. This quote illustrates the importance of attachment and the importance of love and the understanding of preventing and treating trauma. Although many think of trauma as something that happens in war zones, most trauma and the ability to cope with it begins in the home. Relationships hold the key to living better lives. Also, parents can be educated about attachment, creating better environments for children. Basically, everything that I said. And relationships with friends, it's, it's not okay. It's a sign of trauma trauma too, that whole loner mentality. We were created to be social beings, not solitary. We're not animals. We're not cheetahs. I love cheetahs. They're my favorite animals. And cheetahs are known to be very solitary too, right? They may have like a partner to hunt with, but it's really rare. They're very solitary beings, but we're not animals. Guys, we're people. We're meant to be around people. It, it's not, we can want our private time, but we should feel away if we don't have friends. We shouldn't tell ourselves, well, it's and da, 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 da. that is a problem. And those attachment issues is from our early child is what creates this disconnection where we feel like we can go on without people. I don't need to call people. I don't care. I'm not. Those type of relationships and having healthy attachments to people is what helps us to grow. So do not run from healthy attachments. It's okay to tell people you miss them. It's okay to tell people you love them. It's okay to express how much you care and that you value their time. You actually want to hang out with them. It's okay to have healthy attachment, but everybody wants to be detached. And that is a form of trauma. He speaks again medication a lot and I love that with this book it's very pro holistic figuring things out the best way not taking like pharmaceutical substances because it can do more damage than not and make people more crazy and talk therapy is very popular but there are more he talks about different forms of therapy too like I said where he gives you the tools I will always 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 say that God, this verse kept coming to me all the time and I had to save it every time I log into Instagram. And Philippians 4 verse 6 to 7 says all the time, 
Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. This verse keeps coming back to me because I was an anxious person. And this is what I have on my lock screen. Pray before every decision, big or small. God is in all the details of your life. I had to put that as my lock screen as a reminder because in my testimony, I'll say this. I suffered with anxiety a lot to the point where I thought I was always having a heart attack or a stroke, a panic attack. And I've had a couple people in my family that suffer with that too or high blood pressure, very sensitive. I worried about everything to the point where sometimes I would not leave my house. I would not talk to certain people. I'm anxious to go to certain places. And I was on medication for it and also herbal. (laughs) You know, I was living, trying to find every way to quiet my anxiety, my thoughts and just be chill. And there would have been a time where probably I would have been embarrassed and not share. And you know, as it is in the Haitian culture, we don't really share mental health stuff. We're really embarrassed to be this vulnerable. This verse, I didn't understand it before, but I'll say for me, I will always say that, you know, letting things go to God. I've experienced him in my life. I know he is real. Like, I don't even know what to tell you guys. He is real to me. And if I've experienced, had my own personal experiences. And once I started to let go of everything that I cannot control, I don't need medications for anything. I literally have a quick talk with God. You don't need to have a long prayer. Matter of fact, there's Bible verses where God tell you, Don't be praying like the pagans with many words and chants and you don't got to. Sometimes I just be talking to God regular in my mind, like just like that eyes open and all. And he answers me and I talk to him. I tell him the things of my heart sincerely open. Like, I think I'm hurt by this, that, that, whatever a person is. Lord, help me. How can I get over this, that, and the third? And it really does help. And um, religion for a lot of people can be a form of therapy. It is a form of therapy. People don't talk about that enough. God really is the best therapist, the Bible, to really let go of everything. And see the love and pray about everything and trust him you really do experience the peace and so don't neglect that also because i will always end my videos like that and i just say that pay attention to the kids around you the adults around you the parents around you the women around you and be more kind and compassionate to people who are hurt give them an encouraging word it makes takes nothing from you to compliment someone to make their day to engage with someone to just be nice to just be nice and sometimes when you are mean whether you're trolling or this it's a hurt that you might need to evaluate the contents of your heart and yourself and see i need healing and get the healing if you can't afford it there's a lot of free resources there's a lot of videos there's books if you can't get a therapy get books like this there's lots of books on how to overcome a lot of the things that we deal with okay please comment below what other books you guys would like until next time i love you guys